Well, praise the Lord, everyone. It is uh, Wednesday afternoon. Straighten this a little bit. There we go. It is Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock p.m., and that means it is time for our midweek Bible study. I'm glad that you're able to be with us today. I am very excited about our subject matter that we're moving into. We completed our last series last week, and we have brand new uh, material that we'll be going into this week. I have titled our new, our new subject matter, uh, Ghosts, Ghouls, and Bumps in the Night. Uh, those who were part of our church in Dallas know that several years ago we did a lengthy series on uh, all things paranormal as they relate uh, to a Christian perspective on this subject matter. There is an enormous amount of interest in the world today with all things paranormal. Uh, there are all kinds of television shows dealing with uh, ghosts and hauntings and uh, everything from Bigfoot sightings to UFOs. And um, a lot of people in the church uh, are kind of being pulled away to some uh, false ideologies and some uh, wrong ways of thinking because... Uh, the church is not doing a real good job of presenting a Christian perspective as it relates to these things. So, we are going to do that. Our study last time around, which was a good six or seven years ago, uh, gleaned an enormous amount of views. Our uh, Dallas Church website, we wound up with literally tens of thousands of views on our playlist for various videos in this series. Um, I think this time around I'm doing it so that we can have a nice fresh uh, study on this subject matter and it'll be on the new church uh, channel this time around. And um, I think I'm going to be able to do a better job. I hope that I'll be able to do a better job presenting on this subject matter this time around. I'm going to try to be a little bit more structured. I'm going to try to stay on track better than I did last time. Uh, last time I presented it purposely in a rather conversational, kind of, you know, a casual way. I didn't want to come across too heavy. I didn't want to come across too um, heavy-handed, you know. So, um, but this time I'm going to try, uh, while still not coming across too heavy, I am going to try to be more structured and present things in a way that I hope will help people to understand what it is we teach and what we believe and why. Uh, before we go into our study this evening, I'd like us to open with a word of prayer. Master, we love you, God, and we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity once again to share time with our friends online as we explore the Word of God. Master, the subject matter that we'll be looking at over the next couple of months uh, is important subject matter. It relates to spiritual warfare. It relates to the spirit world. And Master, in the name of Jesus, I ask God that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would rest upon the teacher at this hour. Help me to impart unto the people of God the truths of your word, that we might walk away from this session blessed, enlightened, encouraged, inspired. 
Master, anoint every word that's spoken. Touch every ear of every hearer. Help our hearts to be cultivated and prepared by the Spirit of God <clears throat> to receive that which the Spirit would speak unto the church. We ask all this today in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. As I was saying a moment ago, there is an enormous amount of curiosity in the world today relative to all things paranormal. And uh, this curiosity, to be frank, can be very dangerous. Um, people need to be rooted and grounded in the Word of God. They need to understand what God's Word teaches. As we draw closer and closer to the end of this age, folks, spiritual events and spiritual manifestations, according to the Word of God, are going to become more and more prevalent. Okay? For one thing, we have a, de a deceiver in the world who is going to be working himself silly trying to make certain that God's people have all kinds of ideas and thoughts in their head, uh, and the world, for that matter, has all kinds of ideas and thoughts in their head, uh, as to what a sudden um, catching away of the church might be, other than the long-awaited and preached rapture of the church. So the enemy wants to present as many um, ideas, he wants to put as many thoughts out there as to what uh, suddenly if there are millions of people missing around the world, he wants to have all kinds of alternative theories and all kinds of alternative explanations available for this. And uh, so that people will not be convinced that the church has in fact been redeemed. And uh, so as the end is nearing, we're seeing more and more amped up uh, spiritual activity in the world. I do want to start out real quickly by saying this. We do believe absolutely in a spirit realm. We do believe in spirits. We do believe in spiritual activity in the world. Uh, I say that now because our first session, we're going to be looking at something that I always begin any study of this subject matter with. And uh, we won't be getting into that until next week and weeks beyond. Uh, but I want to make it abundantly clear right off the starting line for those of you uh, that might watch this uh, session and not necessarily based on this session, you may or may not care to watch the next session. But if you understand uh, right off the starting line, we will be talking about uh, ghosts, as it were. We will be talking about hauntings. We will be talking about demonic uh, infestation. We will be talking about demonic vexation, uh, uh, demon possession, all of these things, deliverance. All of these subjects will be part of our study, okay? However, when, as children of God, when we begin to look at the subject of all things paranormal, it is imperative that we first begin uh, with the Word of God. Christians need to understand the Word of God is our foundation. It is our sure, absolute go-to in relation to any subject, uh, especially subjects related to anything of a spiritual nature. If you watch a lot of these uh, ghost hunter television shows, paranormal TV shows, uh, 
Uh, you constantly hear, well, many paranormal researchers believe this, and uh, many psychics feel this way, and um, some have written this, and some have written that, and there is absolutely no definitive source or authority that any of these people go to. Uh, if you watch the show with Amy Allen, uh, Amy Allen goes into certain situations and uh, she comes out with all kinds of schemes, you know. Uh, it's, uh, oh, it's not a ghost at all, it's an alien, and somehow or another she's also able to channel aliens, okay. Uh, and then you go to uh, ghost hunters, uh, I forget what the plumbers, you know. Ghost Hunters Roto International, you know, the Roto-Rooter guys, um, they constantly, if you watch that show consistently, there is not one single case they've ever taken that they did not walk away from telling the individuals experiencing uh, phenomena, spiritual phenomena at their location. There is not one single case that they don't walk away saying, we don't think it's trying to hurt anybody. We think it's pretty docile. You know, we think you can live with it and blah, blah, blah. And now that you know, now that we've told you that, you know, everything should be good because now you know everything's fine. Yet you can watch another paranormal show uh, like the young man from Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Paranormal, uh, Paranormal Society or whatever it is. And uh, you watch his program and he's calling in Elaine Warren, famous demonologist and all this, you know. And she comes in and she's discerning things and all of a sudden it's demonic and, and people could really get hurt here. And, you know, so depending on the show you're watching, you'll notice that uh, the outcome is always very different. You could send the Roto-Rooter fellows into the same identical property as you send the Pennsylvania uh, Paranormal Society, and they're going to come to very different conclusions. They're, uh, that their conclusions will be so completely opposite one another, it's not even funny. The reason for this being very simple, there is no definitive authority related to these matters for secular ghost hunters and paranormal researchers. However, as Christians, as children of God, we understand that the Word of God is our authority. I want to talk about that today, and, I want, and we're going to be talking about some other peripheral things that are attached to this <clears throat> but I want to talk about that today because if you're going to approach all things paranormal from a uh, Christian perspective, then obviously you have to begin with the Word of God. Uh, let me read to you Revelation 16, 13, and 14. This is how I'm going to open this up today. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth, end of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So you see, as we get into the book of Revelation, it becomes rather obvious that there's going to be demonic activity. There's going to be very literal, visible demonic activity. And the, the, uh, 
enemy of our soul is going to be busy at work during the tribulation period. Once again, he's going to be doing everything in his power, uh, first of all, to destroy Israel, and second of all, to deceive God's people. So spiritual manifestation is something we see written of in the book of Revelation. We're going to see some more in this regard a little in a little while. Uh, not necessarily today, but in uh, next week and beyond, you're, you're going to see there's more in the book of Revelation related to these things. Um, but we see that spiritual activity is going to obviously be on the rise, and it's going to crescendo as we get into the tribulation period, the second half, which is the judgment of God being poured out on the earth. It is being poured out on the unbeliever, on the uh, those who have not believed and obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, in the Word of God, there are some very specific warnings which are issued related to uh, messing with those things which are paranormal in nature. In Leviticus 20, <clears throat> verse 27, the word of the Lord reads, A man also or woman that hath a familiar spirit, or that is a wizard, shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. In Leviticus 19, verse 31, the word of the Lord reads, Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. The term familiar spirits in the Hebrew, in the original text, is uh, I'll obey. It is defined as a necromancer, one who avoids the dead, a ghost, spirit of a dead one, one who practices necromancy, or one that has a familiar spirit. The term wizard is uh, yidoni, and that is in the Greek, in the Hebrew, and that is defined as a knower. That would be, for instance, a psychic who's supposed to be able to uh, predict your future. One who has a familiar spirit. You see, the Word of God assumes that it is possible for a person to listen to me carefully, folks, to work in conjunction with a spirit. When you see the word familiar spirit or familiar, that is speaking of a spirit that is not possessing a person in the classic sense that it is trying to manipulate or control them or to cause their destruction, but rather it is a spirit that works with a person, uh, bringing knowledge to them that they might not otherwise have so that they can share it. And the problem with uh, people who delve into these black arts, the occult, witchcraft, so on and so forth. The reason that God would appear to come down so hard on these particular people, it's not a matter, listen, it's not a matter of them being, they're so wicked, they're so evil. A lot of people get involved in this stuff, and they honestly think they're doing something good. They honestly think that they are serving mankind, and, you know, they have a, quote, gift and they're sharing it with the world, and they're doing good, and they're helping. But what they don't understand is the spirits are using them to transmit false information. Not, not false information about your loved one, not false information about your future, not false information about even events of your past. No, no, no. But false information theologically information that causes you to either call into question the teaching of God's Word or to flat reject it. Okay? So the first responsibility and the first job of any spirit is to deceive. 
Okay, and we're going to see in a little bit. Uh, next week, we're, we'll be starting out with the spirit world. And we're going to define the spirit world. Who's the devil? Who are demons and devils and unclean spirits? And who are angels? We're going to be looking at those things starting next week. But the demons has one purpose and one purpose only. And that is to call into question what is written in the Word of God. And again, this is why believers have to be firmly rooted and grounded in the Word of God. You watch these TV shows and all kinds of thought processes are introduced. All kinds of ideologies are introduced that contradict the Word of God. And it is not difficult for believers to get sucked into that vacuum. Uh, Lorraine Warren, who I can tell you when I was a young person, I actually watched she and her husband on the Murph Griffin Show many, many years ago. And at that time, they were um, much more classic... Um, they were classic demonologists at that time. And I'll never forget Merv Griffin asking them, you know, well, you know, if these things are real and stuff, you know, how do you, how do you deal with them, you know? And I remember it like it was yesterday because it thrilled my soul that on national television, here was somebody saying these words. And Lorraine Warren said, the name of Jesus Christ. I'll never forget it. Merv Griffin was Jewish. <laughs> and when she said this, he literally just kind of was shocked. He, he just, you know, froze. And you could see this look of surprise on his face, you know. And she said, they respond to the name of Jesus Christ. And that is how we cast them out. That is how we're able uh, to help people. And uh, I was so excited to see that. But you know what happened? The longer that Ed and Lorraine were involved in paranormal research, so-called, the longer they were involved in that field, all of a sudden, uh, instead of having a classic um, demonologist kind of a position, all of a sudden, you saw them beginning to drift and drift and drift until now, of course, I believe both of them are dead now. Of course, that doesn't mean they're not still working, <laughs> according to the experts anyway. Um, but you noticed in their, their later days, all of a sudden, well, there are good spirits and there are bad spirits. There are human spirits and there are non-human spirits, you know. And all of a sudden, you begin to see all this ideology creeping in because they were not rooted and grounded in the Word of God. They didn't weigh everything always at all times against the Word of God. And the Word of God is our authority. It is the Word of God that is activated by faith. Faith doesn't work just by saying, oh, I have faith, you know. That means nothing. The Scripture said, you believe that there's one God? Paul said, you do well. Even the demons, even the devils believe that and tremble. You know, so believing in God, so to speak, is no great accomplishment. He said that that is just the, the most basic, base requirement of finding God. The Word of God said that if we are to know God, we must first believe that He is. We have to believe in the existence of God. And secondly, we have to understand that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. It's not a punisher of those who don't seek him. No, it's very much the opposite. He is there, he is present, he is waiting. And when people begin 
to seriously, sincerely seek after him, he begins to reward them. He begins to help them. He begins to urge them and lead them because God wants you to know the truth. God wants you not to be bound uh, by demonic oppression or possession. God wants you not to be vexed. He wants you not to be under the influence of some invisible spirit. Uh, and therefore, he rewards as we sincerely and diligently seek him. Now in Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 12, there shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter, listen to the language, with familiar spirits. So again, whenever you see the term familiar or familiar spirit, that means that that spirit is working with an individual so that they're able. Uh, in the modern era, you mostly see uh, psychics so-called claiming that they have a guide. That's not a guide. That's a familiar spirit. They, they have literally attached themselves to a spirit, and that spirit has attached itself to them. And that spirit is feeding them information so as to make their uh, abilities appear legitimate. And they are at a certain level. I mean, they are legitimate uh, to that extent. However, if you listen to the information, there is never one time that a spirit, not one time watching any of these television shows, not one time will you ever hear a spirit pointing to the Word of God. Never one time will you hear one of these ghosts quoting the Word of God and pointing people to Jesus Christ. Never happens. Not one single time. And yet, interestingly enough, you'll hear these people, Oh, there's ghosts of nuns running around. There's ghosts of priests running around. There's the ghost of a preacher man that used to preach in the church here. And yet, for all of that, no matter how religious this spiritual entity is supposed to have been during their life, they never one time point to God. You never see it. And you will see over and over again, and, and again, I'm just talking plain basic knowledge here. If you watch these uh, paranormal shows, you will often see where the spirit will actually advise the people. They'll get a medium or, you know, one of these paranormal experts to come in. And all of a sudden, the spirit is saying, get rid of your Bibles. Get rid of your Bibles. Throw away your Bible. Remember how many times we've watched that on television shows? They don't want the Word of God because you might consult it. They know that the truth is in there. And therefore, they want that as far from you as they can get it. And I've seen programs where people were so terrified by the activity that was going on around them that they did exactly what the Spirit said. They went through their house and literally purged it of every Bible they could find. And that is the utter and complete opposite of what they ought to have done. Instead, they should have gone to the Word of God and found the truth concerning uh, ghosts and ghouls and bumps in the night and employed those truths because as you speak the truth of God's Word in faith, a lot of people have this idea about religion and religious articles, you know, Bibles and crosses, like somehow they're magic amulets. Folks, those things are objects. They are just objects. We're going to look in a minute. 
The weapons of our warfare are spiritual. They are not carnal. You cannot touch our weapons. You cannot feel our weapons. Our weapons are not carved. They are not made out of metal. They are not made out of wood. They're not made out of stone. Our weapons are spiritual. And therefore, you have to understand that uh, crucifixes and crosses and Bibles and uh, uh, medals of saints, you know, and all this foolishness. Uh, those things, my friend, do not trouble spirits. And uh, folks, a lot of times will say, yeah, but I saw a show where, you know, they had a statue of St. Michael, or they had this, or they did that, or they said this. And boy, the spirit really seemed to be troubled. Sure it did. But does that Does that go with the teaching of God's Word? Does it, is it supported by the Word of God? No. So what does that tell you? I'll tell you what it tells you. They don't mind making you believe that some of these things work that don't work. And again, for any of you who watch these shows religiously, how many times? We have experts come in. We have a psychic come in. We have a priest come in. Blah, 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 blah. And they're using all these artifacts. They're using all these uh, accoutrement, religious, you know, articles. And uh, then they turn their holy water and all this stuff. And then they turn around and they said, but after a couple of months, bam, it came back and it came back with a vengeance. So did it work? No, it did not work, folks. These things are happy to make you believe that something has worked. They're, oh, they don't have any problem making you believe that they... Listen, if I'm fighting a war, I'm perfectly happy if my enemy is convinced that some of their uh, uh, weaponry works against my side when in fact it doesn't. Sure, because then they're spending all their money and all their energy and all their resources trying to produce more and more of weaponry that really doesn't work. It doesn't affect us in the least. And the enemy is perfectly happy to have you putting your confidence and putting your faith in things that have absolutely no impact on them whatsoever. They're happy to make you believe that, you know, hanging crosses on the wall and hanging crucifixes and putting a Bible in every room and doing, you know, sprinkling holy water. Amy will have you running around the house nude with a midget uh, mind reader and, uh, you know, but the, the mind reader has to have one leg and be a mother of two children under six. She gives these ridiculous, ridiculous requirements for accomplishing, you know, cleaning the house of, of these spiritual influences. And with, and if you listen to the woman, my God, people, how hard is it for people to understand? She stands there and gives the most asinine, ridiculous, specific um, uh, requirements, you know, and this way, Chances are 9 out of 10, the person's not going to be able to find what Amy described. You know, a one-legged American Indian uh, mother of two who happens to be four feet tall and has three fingers missing on her right hand, you know. And so what happens is the people do the best they can, but ultimately, if everything fails, as it will, they can't blame Amy because Amy will say, well, but I told you exactly what you needed. I, you know, I gave you very specific instructions and you really needed to get exactly what I said. You follow? It's not, not hard to follow, folks. All right, so listen now. Deuteronomy 18, I'm going to begin at verse 11. Uh, we started earlier or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, 
And because, listen, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Now in Isaiah chapter 8, verses 19 and 20, And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep, meaning that predict the future, or look into the future, and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. If they're not speaking in conjunction with and in agreement with the word of God, then it is not a godly spirit that you're dealing with. Okay? And so we understand through Isaiah, we understand exactly why God put this uh, prohibition on pursuing uh, soothsayers and uh, psychics and what have you and wizards and witches and all of these things, those who consult with familiar spirits. And the reason is because that is contrary to faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. He said, should you not seek unto your God? He said, why would you go seek somebody who can tell you the future? Why would you go seek somebody who can tell you uh, the, the status or the state of your loved one and so on and so forth? He said, should you not rather go to God with these things? The Lord wants us to be able <coughs> to walk in fellowship and in communion with him. He wants us to rely on him. He promises that he is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He promises that he is trustworthy. He is dependable. He is consistent. And it requires faith. Faith means, listen carefully, faith means that oftentimes we don't know. See, when you got to know what's going to happen tomorrow, you're not able to trust God for tomorrow. There's an old song that says, I don't need to understand. I just need to hold his hand. I don't ever have to ask the reason why. For I know he'll make a way through the night and through the day. I don't need to understand. I just need to hold his hand. That is the nature of faith. You see, folks, when we try to control or we try to manipulate our circumstance, especially when you're talking about the occult and witchcraft and, you know, santeria and all these sorts of uh, practices, um, you're, that is literally witchcraft. That, that is the occult. You're trying to make things happen that you think are going to benefit you or going to help you. You know, I've got to cast a love spell on this person, you know, because I'm crazy about this person. Now, what if you don't know jack squat about that person? What if that person's an axe murderer? What if that person's a serial killer? You don't know. But if you're one who thinks that it is within your right to control what happens to you and what happens in your life. You can control which job you get. Oh, I just cast a spell. I just go and light this color candle and, and I use this um, spell from this spell book, you know, and uh, I'll get that job I want and I'll get that car I want and I'll get that house I want and I'll get that man I want. And it, there is a naivete in that thinking. Faith understands that God knows best. Faith understands that our God, who is our caregiver, 
he knows the end from the beginning. He knows things we don't know. And therefore, if we want something, but the Lord does not open the door for us to have that, whatever it may be, then there's a very real possibility that there was something about that that would have been harmful to us. And therefore, the Lord, in spite of our deep desire to have it, the Lord prevented us from getting it in order to protect us. So faith is trust and reliance, whereas witchcraft is control and manipulation. Witchcraft assumes, in a sense, that you know as much or more than God does. And that is a very dangerous mindset. Many Christians today uh, run around, I talked about it Sunday, they use the name of Jesus like it's a magic amulet. Oh Lord, give me that job in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And they just think if they say it enough and they put enough heart in it, that they're just going to force God's hand and he's just going to have to give it to them. That is not faith. Okay, that's witchcraft. And quite frankly, uh, in the modern spirit-filled church, folks, I, I preached a message in Dallas some years ago um, that compared the uh, modern-day thinking in the church with witchcraft. There are people in the church who literally believe that everything they want, every job they want, every spouse they want, every car they want, every house they want, where, uh, you know, every piece of jewelry they want, that, bless God, they have the magic power through prayer and faith to attain these things, glory to God. And nowhere in the equation do they ever stop and say, not my will, Lord, but thy will be done. So there's a reason that God told the people of Israel that people who practice these things were to be put to death. It sounds terribly harsh. But people, as well-meaning as they may have been, they may be as innocent as anything, in thinking that, you know, what they're doing is good. They think they know what they're dealing with. They think they know what they're doing. But they also were potentially going to lead God's people astray and lead them in a the wrong direction. So God said, listen, if people are practicing these things, I want them wiped clean. I want them wiped out, period. Why? Because that way you destroy the seed. If you destroy the seed, you never get to the plant, okay? If you destroy the seed, then you never get to the place where they are leading God's people astray with false doctrine and false beliefs, leading them into idolatry, leading them into uh, 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 the occult and witchcraft and other things of this nature. There is one example in Scripture of a uh, person who had passed away being brought back from the dead uh, by reason of um, a conjurer, a woman who was identified as a witch. That story is found in 1 Samuel chapter 28, verses 3 through 15. Now Samuel was dead. And all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together and they pitched in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Then said Saul unto his servants, 
Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment, and he went, and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night, and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up whom I shall name unto thee. So he's saying to this woman, I want you to divine somebody that I'm going to name to you, okay? And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done. She doesn't realize she's talking to Saul. How he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? She said, I can't do this because Saul's, you know, made a decree. And boy, what are you trying to do? Set a trap for me and I'll wind up dead? Verse 10, and Paul sware to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice, and the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, an old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me. And God is departed from me, and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. So Saul initially was trying to do the right thing. He was going to the Lord. He was conferring with the prophets. He was trying to find somebody that could help him hear from God. However, the Lord had already declared to Saul that the Spirit of the Lord had departed. The anointing that he had initially to be king had been removed from him. And at this point, his clock was just winding out, uh, and David had been anointed to replace him as king. But Saul didn't like the idea that uh, before Samuel was dead, you know, he could go to Samuel. Samuel was the point man between God and the king. Uh, prior to the king, Samuel was uh, the spiritual leader of Israel, and he represented the Lord before the people of Israel so that they did not require a king. But they wanted a king, and the Lord said, okay, fine, I'll let you have a king, but you're not going to like what you get. And Saul was the answer to their desires, and ultimately they didn't much like what they got. And so now all of a sudden Saul, the anointing has left him, God is not talking to him, and suddenly he decides, well, you know what, I'm going to break my own rule, I'm going to go against what I know to be right, and I'm going to see if I can't get a witch who can conjure up Samuel, and maybe Samuel can still serve as an in-between between me and God. And we see that Samuel indeed did come. What does that tell you? Well, it tells us several things. It tells us the dead ain't dead, number one. The dead aren't dead. Jesus said, 
hasn't God said, I am the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob? He says, he's the God of the living, not of the dead. He said, these people are still living. These people are still out there. We read the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man goes to hell. The Lazarus goes to Abraham's bosom, meaning to the, to, to the same space that Abraham occupied. And the rich man, according to the word of God, sees both Lazarus and the rich and uh, Abraham. So what does that tell you? Tells you the dead ain't dead. No, even after death, we retain consciousness. However, nowhere in the Bible do we read that spirits are roaming around the undead, you know, that uh, people have died, but the, their circumstance was so tragic, they didn't realize they were dead, and their spirit is roaming around. No, no, no. They're, the Word of God says it is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. Period. When you have a spirit that supposedly, I'm kind of jumping ahead of myself, but, but it, it'll be okay, because we'll wind up covering this again in the future, but to kind of give people a good idea of, of where we're going with this. When you have a spirit that's telling you, oh, I died this tragic death, and I didn't even realize I had died, so I'm kind of stuck in the middle here. What is that, what false notion does that create in the mind of many people? Oh, good, so after death, I'm not going to hell, because I can just hang around here. I can just choose to stay on earth and roam around as a ghost. It may not be ideal, but I know I've lived like a dog. I know I rejected God. I know that I refuse to believe the gospel. So I know my end isn't going to be very good. So luckily, luckily, based on what I've heard all these wonderful dead people tell me, I can just roam around the house I grew up in, or I can just roam around my favorite bowling alley, or I can just roam around at my job and spend eternity wearing my, uh, you know, uh, security guard uniform. Okay? And so this is what happens. People are made to believe things that contradict the Word of God. And these spirits are deceiving on purpose. They know what they're doing. All right. So we understand that the reason God appeared to be so uh, violently opposed to those who engaged in um, divination and what have you is that that was contrary to faith. And in order to... Uh, serve God and live for God, we have to operate from a place of faith. In 1 Peter 5 and 7, the word of the Lord reads, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. He is our caregiver. God is our caregiver. This, does, this passage does not simply mean, oh, he cares for you. The Lord has concern for you. That's not what this passage means, says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. What, what is being said here in reality is, give the Lord everything that is of concern to you. Give the Lord everything that's too heavy for you. Give the Lord everything that troubles you, because he is your caregiver. If you live at home and you have uh, a live-in nurse, for instance, right? Every little thing you can't do, you're going to ask your nurse to do. Why are you going to ask him or her to do that? Well, it's easy because that's their job. That's what they do. That's what they're there for. And what people don't realize is when we come into relationship with God, God assumes that role. He says, now you're my child, that's the whole nature of a father-child relationship. When have you ever seen, you know, a father and the, the kid can't do something, says, Daddy, Daddy, you know, I need help with this. And the father says, well, you know, to hell with you. I'm not going to be bothered with it. I don't have time for that, you know. No, they're going to help because they're the caregiver. 
That's their job as a parent. And people don't understand when we cry to God according to the spirit of adoption, Abba, Father, we are literally saying the literal translation of that term, Abba, Father, literally it translates Daddy. That's, that's basically what you're saying. It is a very personal, heartfelt, emotional, connected father-child relationship. And therefore, we don't say, Father, Father, come help me, Father. No. Uh, when we cry out to God as an adopted child of God, the Word of God said that the Spirit of God in our life helps us to cry, Abba, Father. We are able to literally simply say, Daddy. And uh, He is going to be a loving, caring, nurturing Father, I don't know what kind of teaching you've been under. I know a lot of people who call themselves Christians have been subjected to some really raunchy, wrong teaching concerning the nature of God. But I'm here to tell you today, the Lord wants you to succeed. He wants you to make heaven. He wants you to be saved. The Word of God. Again, you notice I'm constantly saying the Word of God, the Word of God, the Word of God, because that is our source. That is the authority upon which we function. The Word of God tells us that, um, yeah, it does. Now I done forgot the thought process I was in the middle of. All right. Uh, I'll get there in a minute. It'll come to me. In Psalm 91 and verse 2, the Word of God declares, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. This is what the Lord wants from us, not running to a psychic, not running to somebody who practices divination, not going to a Ouija board, okay? He said, I want you to trust in me and Him will I trust. In Psalm 91 and verse 9, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. Means, literally means that God has become our resting place. He has become our housing. He has become the place we go to be safe and to sleep and to rest, and to recharge ourselves, and to nourish ourselves. So you see, this is the nature of the relationship. Isn't this good stuff? See, I told you, people think when you, when you put a title on a, on a Bible study series, they think they know what they're going to hear, but there's a whole lot of wonderful stuff that comes into play. And then in Psalm 94, verse 22, but the Lord is my defense, and my God is the rock of my refuge. Hallelujah. That is the nature of the relationship that God's people are called to. And for that reason, we have no business operating outside of the realms of faith. The Lord is concerned about us. He is our caregiver. He wants to take care of us, but he needs us to trust him. He's not going to tell us every step of the way uh, what's going to happen. He's not going to tell us today what's coming tomorrow all the time. Sometimes he does. Um, but the point is, we need to be able to trust him. That is the nature of faith. In Matthew 7 and 7, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. If the Lord has said, ask, seek, and knock, and I will answer, uh, allow you to find and open it to you, why do we need a psychic? Why do we need divination? He said, no, you got a question, ask me. You need a door open, knock. You follow? Amen. Luke chapter 11, verse 9. 
uh, we have a confirmation of this. And uh, the word of the Lord said, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. There are gifts of the Spirit. There are gifts that operate through the Spirit of God and the Spirit of God alone. There is never, ever, when it comes to God, this is how it works. It's very simple. You are either dealing with His Spirit directly, or you are dealing with something outside of Him. Period. That, that's all. The Lord does not use anyone else in the spirit realm to do anything. The Word of God declares, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. So everything God does, he does by his spirit. He does it himself. The gifts of the Spirit that we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul repeatedly makes uh, the statement, by the same Spirit, by the same Spirit, by the same Spirit. Why was he saying this? So that somebody doesn't come along and say, oh, we had tongues and interpretation in our church Sunday, and Mother Mary said thus and so. I literally heard a Catholic charismatic say that once. She said, oh, we had tongues and interpretation in our church Sunday, and, and Mother Mary said thus and so. Wrong. 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 All the gifts of the Spirit are operations of the Spirit of God. That is why when we do a cleansing of a home, or I like to call it a purging of a home, um, or whatever, a location of some sort, we command every spirit that is not God, not every spirit that is not of God. No, because God only operates by one spirit, and that is his own. Okay? So therefore we say every spirit that is not God, is not welcome in this place. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 7 and 8, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. Got people, they go to psychics, they go to uh, people who practice, you know, divination and what have you, uh, because they want to know something. I need to know what I'm supposed to do. I need to know how to go about this, you know. And yet, God has gifts of the Spirit that are in place. He operates by His own Spirit through the body in order to convey to us messages at times that we need. When we need to know the wisdom of God in a given situation, when we need to know the right thing to do, we can receive a word of wisdom. When we need to know the right thing, uh, or when we need to know something, um, and, and, and it is honestly imperative that we know, and God knows you need to know, he will pass it on to you by reason of a word of knowledge. I like to share the anecdote, um, how the Lord uses these gifts. I've told this story before, but for those of you who are new to our ministry and certainly new to this subject matter, um, my little baby brother had come to live with me many years ago, and he uh, was only a teenager, about 12, 13, and uh, we moved to another town, and we were uh, not yet settled on a church. The Lord had spoken to me about a church that we passed on the road, the main road, and told me that's where he wanted me to go. But I had been preaching in a couple of churches in that area, so basically I, I wasn't free at that point to go to church anywhere. So I knew when I was free, I was going to go to this church because the Lord told me to go to that church. 
But before I'd ever had a chance to visit that church, uh, he and I had gone back to another town that we had moved from, which was about 30, 35 minutes away, and visited a dear old saint that was a, a precious friend of mine. I loved her dearly, Sister Chambers. And we had gone to visit her, and I'm going to try to keep this story as succinct as I can. And I told my brother, I said, Sister Chambers is going to offer us something to eat. I said, but bless her heart, she'd give, she would give everything she owned away. And I didn't want to take up her resources, so I told that my brother, his name is Dallas. I told Dallas, I said, when Sister Chambers offers us something to eat, I said, um, just decline. I said, I'm going to take you out to eat after, you know, when we leave. I said, so uh, let's not eat her food because she needs what she's got. And so anyway, time came, you know, she offered us. I said, no, Sister Chambers, I promised Dallas I was going to take him out to eat. So I'm going to take him. And, uh, and so we left her house and I said, where do you want to eat? And he said, how about this new Pizza Hut in town? So I drove to the Pizza Hut, pulled up in front of the restaurant, and I sat there for a minute. And all of a sudden, I, I just kind of got quiet. I sat there for a minute, and Dallas had gotten to know me real good. And he looked at me and said, what do he tell you now? And I said, Dallas, if you don't mind, can we go back to Athens and eat? In Athens, I said, I feel like the Lord's telling me that there's somebody I need to minister to uh, up there. And he said, okay. So we drove back to Athens. We got to the main traffic light in town. And there were two um, Dairy Queen restaurants in Athens. And uh, one would be straight ahead on this road we were on. And the other one, you'd have to make a right at this intersection, go up the road a little ways. And it was on the left-hand side. So I said to Dallas, I said, where would you like to eat? Because I, I hadn't felt the Lord give me any specific direction as to where to go. I just knew he wanted me back in Athens. So I figured he'll, he'll point me in the right direction, you know. <laughs> so Dallas said, well, we don't normally go to the one straight ahead. Let's go to the one straight ahead. We always go to the one over here up the, to the right. So the light turned green, and I literally found myself turning the wheel, making a right-hand turn. He said, I thought we were going to go. I said, I said, I don't know what it is. I said, I couldn't even keep the wheel straight. I, n nothing was pulling on the wheel. I'm not claiming anything was there. But I, all of a sudden, I just felt, nope, you need to go to the right. So I just immediately started to go to the right. Now, some people are going to think this is far-fetched. I don't care what you think. I lived it, so I know. And uh, God is real, folks. And the gifts of the Spirit are real. And people who think they have to run after necromancers, they have to run after psychics, they have to run after soothsayers and fortune tellers and tarot readers and Ouija boards and all this foolishness, they do so because they don't know my God. They certainly don't know him the way I know him. I'll tell you that right now. So I drove to the, to the uh, Dairy Queen that we normally would go to anyway. And uh, we walked in the restaurant, and I looked across the restaurant. It was basically empty. There was one lady sitting at a table all by herself. And uh, I, was, I was real strict Pentecostal holiness at the time. So I was all about, you know, the ladies didn't cut their hair, and they didn't wear makeup and jewelry, and they didn't wear pants, you know, the whole nine yards. And I looked at this lady, and... And her hair was cut and frosted, and she was wearing a skirt outfit and everything. But, and she had, you know, a ring or two on her hand. And just looking at her, I thought, well, Lord, my Lord, she, if I walk up to her and tell her that she's the person that, that I feel like you sent me to minister to, she may think I'm nuts because she don't look Pentecostal. And so, but I, oh, I could feel the Lord just pushing me. That's who I want you to minister to. That's who I want you to minister to. So I gave Dallas the money, told him what to order me. And I said, get it and sit at that table over there. So I'm going to go try to talk to this lady for a minute. And as I'm walking toward her table, before I could get there, another lady came in who happened to be Pentecostal holiness head to toe. 
And she goes over and starts hugging on this lady and talking to her and stuff. And the first thought that went through my mind was, well, praise God, at least she knows Pentecostal people, so I won't look like a total nut to her, you know? All, all based on appearances, to be honest. Yeah, I'm judging her based on appearance at the time. And so um, the other lady leaves, goes to the counter and orders something. So I figure, well, let me take advantage. I wasn't trying to get both of them. You know, I didn't know what the Lord was going to give me. So I don't want to embarrass her, you know, with anything. And I walked over to her and I started to tell her, I said, ma'am, um, I know this may sound crazy. I don't know. I said, but I'm a Pentecostal minister. I was in uh, another town. And the Lord spoke to me to come to Athens. There was somebody here he wanted me to minister to. Said he brought me here to this Dairy Queen. And the minute I walked in the door and saw you, I knew you were the person that he wanted me to minister to. And she said, oh, praise the Lord. I'm Pentecostal too. Totally shocked me, you know. And about that time, the other lady comes back over. And she's kind of like, Almost like, what's going on? <laughs> and the other lady and I ultimately became best of friends. We were real good friends for years. She was even with me when I started my third church. And so uh, this other lady comes over and she's like, yeah, to be honest, kind of nosy. You know, what's going on? You know, to, but lighthearted. And uh, so I told her, I said, well, I'm a Pentecostal preacher. I said, and... I was down there in Canton, and the Lord laid on my heart to come to Athens. I said, he told me there was somebody here he wanted me to minister to. So I walked through the door. I saw this dear lady, and the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, that's the one right there. I said, so uh, I just came over so the Lord can use me however he wants to use me. And she says, oh, well, can I sit with you? And, of course, her friend said, yeah, you know. And so the both of them sat on the other side of the table. I sat down across from them. I reached over and I took that lady's hand. <laughs> Tell me God ain't real. And I said, honey, whoo. I said, God sees how heartbroken you've been, how disappointed and how crushed you've been how you've been mistreated uh, and how you've been mishandled and how you are struggling right now to hold on to your faith. And he knows the pain that you're in. He knows what you've been through. And all of a sudden, all this stuff just started pouring out of me as if I knew something. I never met this lady a day in my life. Now, if I'm talking gibberish, you know, if what I have to say doesn't even begin to apply to this lady, then I'm going to look like the biggest ding-dong on the planet. But I'm just pouring out what God laid in my spirit. And then I went into, and you're about to make a decision that you know is the wrong decision on a very big matter. And the Lord sent me here to tell you, listen, I know your pain, but don't you do that. Don't you do what you're about to do because it's out of your pain that you're doing this. And yet at the same time, you know it's the wrong, to see, the, the wrong choice to make, the wrong decision. This lady and her friend got to tears just, blow, just flowing down their faces. And the Spirit of the Lord come down in that Dairy Queen. And you could feel the power of God like we were in a camp meeting. And all of a sudden, this lady and her friend and me got to talking in tongues and praying in the Holy Ghost in Dairy Queen. My poor brother's sitting a couple tables over eating this hamburger. And I'm sitting there having church in Dairy Queen with this lady. And boy, we had a wonderful time. And, and when we finally come down from it, you know, this lady said to me, I was married for over 20 years to the same man. We attended the same Holiness Pentecostal Church together for our entire marriage. She said, I've got kids that are grown up and married and have kids of their own. She said, uh, one day I was at home. She said, we never had a, 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 my husband and I never had a minute's trouble. She said, there was no sign of any 
issue in our marriage whatsoever. She said all of a sudden one night he'd come home and he grabbed the suitcase and he started packing and he informed me that he was leaving me. She said I was devastated, absolutely devastated. She said but he turned around and left me, she said, and I found out he went up the road a couple miles and moved into a trailer park with a woman that apparently he'd been having an affair with. On top of all that, he got her pregnant. So now he's leaving me, filing for divorce, so he can go live with this woman and be with this girl that he got pregnant, a much younger woman. She said, I was never so devastated in my life. My whole family was in utter shock. She said, we didn't know what all was going on. She said, I've never been so hurt. I've never been so devastated and disappointed. She said, every word you said described exactly what I've been going through. She said, but then, she said, one day I'm sitting in church she said, all of a sudden, here comes my ex-husband with his new wife and baby. Walking into the building like nothing ever happened. Sits down in the pew and, you know, and she said, and the pastor never said a word to him. She said, knowing the devastation that I had just gone through, Knowing the pain that I had endured, she said, my pastor hurt me, my church hurt me, because they literally allowed him to just walk in, sit down, and act like nothing had ever happened. And you can imagine, come on folks, you can imagine the pain and the agony one would feel emotionally to go through this experience. She said, now... I know a man, a Spanish man, a, a Mexican man, that really is quite enamored with me. And she said, honestly, I've been so lonely. And I've gone through so much depression. And I, everything, all these things I had said, to, I talked about being lonely. I've talked about her depression. All of these things I had said to her. And she said, you know, I went through all this, like you said. And she said, and this man is really enamored with me. And he's Catholic, and I'm Pentecostal, she said. But you know what? I'm so lonely. She said, he proposed marriage to me. And she said, and I literally was sitting here right now thinking that I know that I shouldn't. But I think I'm going to say yes because... I'm just so broken and I'm so heartsick and I'm so lonely and I'm so depressed and I'm so tired of being alone. And she said, and then all of a sudden God sent a man of God to me that doesn't know me from nobody. And he told me everything I've been going through. And he let me know that God was aware that the Lord saw my pain, that I should not for one minute think that my caregiver wasn't caring and that he didn't see and know what I was going through. And she said, oh, brother, you can't even know the comfort that those words spoke to me. God himself spoke to me and told me, I've got your back, but you're about to make a very bad decision. And it, it's not going to end well. If you go that route, it's not going to end well. And she says, so now I know what direction I should go in and, and, and how I should handle this. And she said, I'm not going to do that. And boy, I'm telling you, we just have a time in the Holy Ghost. Folks, she didn't have to go seek out a fortune teller. She didn't have to go seek out uh, a Ouija board. She didn't have to go hire a psychic. No, if we need to hear from God. The gifts of the Spirit are in operation within the church so we can. And believe me, this is one reason why it breaks my heart that so many churches in the world today are not what they ought to be. They're not where they ought to be. The gifts of the Spirit are not able to function and they're not able to flow 
in a lot of churches, uh, even Pentecostal churches. They certainly don't flow in Baptist and Methodist and Presbyterian and Episcopalian because they don't believe in these things to begin with. So, right? But even in a spirit-filled church in today's world, they're so caught up in politics and culture wars and things they shouldn't be uh, bothered with that the gifts of the Spirit are not able to flow and function within the church. I'll tell you this, folks, they, they function in our church. I promise you that. But that's just one example of the gifts of the Spirit serving that function, you know, of providing us with the information we need when we need it. I could give you examples, as I did in our study about the gifts of the Spirit. I talked about uh, uh, how each of them operates and for what purpose and what have you. I don't have time to do that during this study. We're down to our last 10 minutes or so, so I'm going to try to quickly sew up session one. Why then is the Word of God so important when we look at the subject of all things paranormal? And I hope you all will give me a little bit of latitude on time. I may need an extra five minutes or ten minutes, okay? But I'll try not to go beyond that. Why is the Word of God so imperative? Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. When we read about the whole armor of God in Ephesians 6, it is all defensive the breastplate, the helmet, the shield, all of those things are meant to defend against attack. There is only one weapon in the believer's arsenal that is offensive in nature, that we can actually use against our enemy, and that is the Word of God. Hallelujah! In Hebrews 4 and 12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God is our only offensive weapon. But we're fighting a spiritual warfare, and we are fighting a spiritual enemy. The Word of God, then, is our weapon of choice when coming against an attack instigated by the enemy. In Psalm 18 and verse 30, the Word of God declares, As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. The word of the Lord is tried. 
It's been put to the test. It's proven itself to be trustworthy. Proverbs 30 and 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. One of the most uh, popular scriptures that most believers are familiar with concerning the word of the Lord. Isaiah 40 verse 8. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. When you look at the story, and, and I am closing tonight, of the Lord being tempted in the wilderness by Satan. The Spirit of God leads Jesus into the wilderness for the purpose of being tempted by the devil. And the Word of God says, verse 2, chapter 4, Matthew, And when he, Jesus, had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, Listen, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Jesus used the sword. He resorted to the word of God. He's quoting scripture. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and sendeth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, now the devil has the nerve to be quoting scripture as well. <laughs> Don't think the devil can't quote scripture, take things out of context, and try to mislead you. It is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus saith unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. How does he respond? Does he punch the devil? Does he kick the devil? Does he call fire down from heaven upon the devil? No. He hits him with the word of God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, get behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. When you understand that the word of God is our sure foundation, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Then, my friend, you're able to approach every subject related to the paranormal from a biblical perspective. Does the word of God support this notion or not? What does the word of God say, for instance, about the dead? You know, does the word of God say that you can die and then hang out for a while and roam the earth? You know, does the word of God, what does it say? And we're going to be looking at this during the course of this study. We're going to look at scriptures that deal expressly with exactly what the word of the Lord says concerning this matter. And what a lot of people don't realize, if you understand the word of God is a sword that God has placed in our hand and you have confidence in the word of the Lord and you have faith in God, then you're going to understand that believers have authority and you're able to use the word of God. There are many people out there who claim today their home is haunted. They claim today they're vexed or cursed or whatever the case might be. And what you're going to find out through the course of this study 
is if you can get your faith where your faith needs to be. Our faith is in God, but his word is a tool that he has placed in our hand. It is the only offensive weapon we have. It is the only offensive weapon we need. Then you will be able to understand you can clean your own house. Now, there's a lot of preachers, I'm going to tell you, they go out of their way to make you think that you need me to come. You need me to deal because I'm the big shot. I'm, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, Mr. High Holy and, and you know, uh, and I am one of probably the few teachers in the entire Christian movement that will tell you plain as day, you don't need me. You don't need me at all. When you get your doctrine straight, when you get your faith right, when you understand this thing as you ought to understand this thing, then you'll be able to walk through your house, listen to me, and quote scripture. Tell the devil, every demon in hell, every spirit that is vexing you, this is what the word of the Lord says. I know, I know you're not a ghost. Because the word of the Lord said the dead know nothing. The word of the Lord said it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. And as you begin to quote the word of God, if you believe what you're saying, folks, this is where the mistake is made. I told you a lot of people think that uh, religion, you know, and religious things do the work all by themselves. No, they don't. These things were accomplished through faith. So you have to be. This is why when you watch these shows, you know, how many times do we see families that try to do things? And, oh, well, we were reading the Bible and we were doing this and we were doing that. We were saying the Lord's Prayer, you know, and it's all mechanical to them because they really have no faith in God whatsoever. They really aren't coming from a position of faith. If you're coming from a position of faith, the Word of God tells us that we have authority over these things. And therefore, once you first understand you have authority, then quoting scripture and what have you is not a, a, a mechanical exercise, but rather you are exercising your authority. You're saying, no, no, I know what's going on because the Word of God says thus and so. The Word of God says thus and so. The Word of God says thus and so. And I promise you, by the time you're done, those things will be gone and gone forever because they cannot stand in the face of truth. But we first must embrace the Word of God. So as we go into this study... Understand, this is why, as Christians, as believers, this is why it is so important that we approach everything, especially as it relates to all things paranormal, from a perspective of uh, what does the Word of God say concerning these things. And if you can get that down in your spirit, honey, you're halfway to victory. You're already halfway home. You've already won half the battle. Okay? All right. So I hope that is helpful to you. We're right on time, basically. I didn't go too far over a couple of minutes. I look forward to this study. I'm very excited about it. I think today I was able to stay on track a little bit better <laughs> than the first time around. So I'm going to try to do that every week. Wednesday night, uh, so that we can move right through this study. And uh, I promise you, folks, this will be one of the most exciting, uh, one of the most empowering, uh, one of the most inspirational Bible study series that you have ever uh, embarked upon. So I hope you'll join us for the continuation of our study ghosts, ghouls, and bumps in the night. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we close our time together tonight. Master King Jesus, Savior of lost mankind, Lord, we love you and we thank you for the word of God. How we feel the faith-building presence of a living God 
today. I feel the presence of the Lord in this place. Glory to God. And I believe, God, that you're already making the word of the Lord alive in the hearts and in the spirits of those that are listening. Their faith already is beginning to be encouraged and they're already finding inspiration. They're already beginning to lay hold upon the authority that you have given them as a child of God. Let nothing, no evil thing, nothing that would exalt itself above the higher knowledge of a living God prevent those that need to hear this study from hearing it and receiving it and implementing it to the glory of God through Christ our Lord. Master, in the name of Jesus, right now, God, I pray for those who uh, have been living with vexation, those who have been living, Lord, with spiritual influences in their homes, in their lives. I pray right now in the name of Jesus, upon the authority of God's word, that you would loose the presence and power of the Holy Ghost in their home right now, God, in the name of Jesus. Let the light of your spirit, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all, saith the Lord. Let the light of the glory of God shine in their home, shine in their heart, shine in their life right now, and let that light chase out the darkness. Remove every shadow. Bring victory, Master, in the name of Jesus, over every evil thing and every ungodly influence in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Master, help us, Lord, to receive the word of the Lord today with gladness. Help it, Lord, to be not merely uh, words that pass over our hearing, but, Master, words that are uh, literally carved into the tablet of our heart. Help us to walk in the anointing. Help us to walk in the victory. Help us to walk in the authority that we have as children of God. Oh, Jesus, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for this time together. I pray, God, that you would keep your hand of protection upon every individual under the sound of my voice. We claim the promise of God's word that the angels of God encamp around about those that fear him. And Master, right now we loose the angels of glory on behalf of God's people. Oh, Master, you're our caregiver. You're the one who cares for us. And we ask God right now that you would help us to establish and maintain victory in Jesus' wonderful name. Thank you, Lord. We ask it all in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I hope that this has been uh, a blessing to you. I know I, I try to kind of mix a little bit of what's coming with uh, the current subject matter, and I do that on purpose because I'm afraid if I just did uh, strictly the present uh, subject matter that we'd wind up kind of losing people because some people... Uh, they kind of have to have a taste, you know, they kind of have to have a little bit of an idea of where we're going uh, in in our teaching. So I needed to offer that as part of tonight's opening session, but I hope you'll join us next Wednesday night. We are going to be looking at the whole structure of the spirit world, God, and then you have, of course, uh, angels, you have the devil, and you have uh, demons or uh, evil spirits, okay? And uh, we'll be beginning to look at that. that that's going to take at least probably, I, I would estimate, two to three weeks to get through um, that one section of this study. And I think you'll be real excited. You're going to learn some things you never knew. You're going to understand some things you never understood before. And before this study is over, uh, you're going to have the devil running 
And I mean, he's going to have his tail tucked between his legs and be running because you will be empowered by the Holy Ghost to walk in victory in Jesus' name. I hope you'll join us next Wednesday at 7 o'clock as well as Sunday at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time as we celebrate our life in Christ. Until we see you again, God bless you. In Jesus' name is our prayer.